Okay, everybody. Thanks again for being here. I'm really excited for this event tonight. I'm glad that we can still gather, even considering the circumstances. Um, so my name is Jamie Dawson. I work for Oregon Wild. And if you haven't heard of us before, we're a statewide environmental conservation nonprofit uh, based in Oregon. I'm based in Bend. Um, and our mission is to protect Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for all Oregonians. Um, I'm really honored to be working for this organization and even more honored to be sharing this film and this panel with you all tonight. Um, this whole event is going to be about an hour. We'll start with the documentary screening and then we'll move to the panel discussion. Uh, we will be asking for questions and comments from the audience, especially questions. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a little question mark. It's in sort of a thought bubble. Um, if you click that, that's where you can type in your questions for the moderators and the panel. Um, and we would love to be in conversation with you tonight. So please be sure to, to enter that in there. Um, and without further ado, I'm really excited to share the film, This Land, with you. And let's go ahead and start it. never thought of myself as a conservationist. I actually used to think that conservation was a really privileged thing and that, you know, for people from historically marginalized communities, I had to think about people first. The battle now is saying, no, I am a conservationist and redefining what that means. I didn't know anything about public lands up until about three years ago. Then I, I realized that there was essentially a showdown happening in our country with the new administration trying to roll back previously protected public lands. I'm a runner and Addie Thompson, she's a runner, and one of the ways that we explore places, one of the ways that we see the world and connect with each other and connect with environments is through running. So we hatched this plan to leave on a running exploratory road trip from Portland, Oregon, down to New Mexico. We're running 150 miles through parts of three of the national monuments that have been points of contention for the current administration. I think people think that because public lands are for the public, all people feel welcome there, and that's just not the case. I think that's what people in like conservation and, and public lands really need to understand, that they might feel welcome, and they might think that it's just a spark that needs to be ignited to care about public lands, but it is so much more than that. Brown versus the Board of Education is to me one of the most important court cases to ever happen in this country, and it is what desegregated schools. It set the precedent to say that separate but equal, which is the basis for segregation being legal, is actually invalid. And what ended up happening was a bunch of the Black State Parks lost funding and shut down. And so we lost a ton of recreational spaces for Black people, but it wasn't like overnight they were suddenly like going to be skipping around in the state park. Like that would have been dangerous. They weren't actually welcome there. Is it 22 tomorrow? I think it's 18 tomorrow and 22 the second day is what you'd said yesterday, but I don't know. I thought, I, yeah, I, I know the first the day was shorter. I remember that. It's day one, so it, it, it's our like test for everything. It's our test for navigating. It's our test for figuring out like what kind of pace is going to be sustainable for that kind of thing. I'm really glad I have Jen and Addie with me. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to start running. I ain't fit to be no mother. I ain't fit to be no wife. Yeah. I've been working. A national monument is 
a protected area of land that was protected under the antiquities act but it's called a monument because it's protected in a different way than a national park would be protected oh that was when we came out oh yeah dude this now we're navigating fucking uncharted yeah shit. that's the problem Throwing the it like has water, water has the it's filled liquid up. inside yeah well so sorry guys what are we doing and then we get to the second thing yeah so i think that's what we should this do. might be another like surprise long day sorry sorry i just like i'm now at first i'm like you know it's hard I don't want to talk about gender and politics and race and the outdoors on the trails in the mountains, but I mean, until we change, then we have to. People like the current administration are coming in and saying, cool, we'll just roll back these protections yeah. real quick. Just while no one's <laughs> While talking. no one's paying attention. No one knows about it. When I tell people like what we're out here doing, why we're doing this, they're like, what do you mean redrawing borders? Or like, what are the monuments anyway? In Grand Circus Escalante, I was so very alone. I was running in a place I'd never been before, and I was running in a place that's not set up for running. I figured out on a map where I was gonna run, but then getting there, maybe that trail's not actually there. Maybe that road actually hasn't been used since the 80s, and maybe that river that you think you're gonna cross is dry, or maybe that river you think you're gonna cross is too high, and you can't actually cross it. But 24.8, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> not what I was intending. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. My running background is on a track. Everything makes sense there. You know exactly how to run the curve and exactly how to run the straight, and there's not really any question about the elements. The elements are everything on the trails. You have ruts, you have inclines, you have, you know, crazy downhills while you're flailing. And then you have heat and bugs and <laughs> cacti and getting lost. So I accidentally came the back way to the Wawi Poodoos. And they're crazy. Came from down there somewhere. up to conferences related to the outdoors, when I show up to town halls related to public lands, like I am 98% of the time the only black woman in the room. I'm the youngest of three kids. My mom's white and my dad's black and my mom's side of the family disowned her when she decided to marry my dad. And it took a few years for our family to come back around and actually claim us. <laughs> if you come from a group that has historically not been welcome, it's gonna take an effort to make you feel welcome. It just doesn't happen overnight. The National Monuments are a representation of us to currently be able to say, what do we care about? These are relatively new national monuments. Right? These are not the national monuments that were established in the early 1900s. These exist as they are now because people have decided to say, this is worth protecting and preserving. People have systematically had their access limited, or more importantly, emotionally and mentally had their access limited. To, to places, to spaces. People have told them repeatedly, you are not to come here, or that is not something that you do. And sometimes that's from within their own community. Our mother, our earth, is not gonna survive if, if we continue to let that rhetoric resonate in young people's heads. The ability to be a public landowner and to live in a place where we've made a decision that certain lands are for everyone, whether you live really close to them or whether they're across the country, that they're there for you. For me, that's really, I mean, it's really special. I think it means like we belong to this place and, and we're its caretakers. 
I didn't grow up with a sense of any kind of control about what the world I lived in looked like. I think the realization of being a public landowner means that we do have a say in what the world that we occupy looks like. It gives me a huge sense of responsibility to ask more questions and learn how I can say more about what's happening in my neighborhood and my state and then my country. In a way, I guess this is what the whole journey has been about, is showing that you are welcome here. I know that a lot of times we haven't seen people that look like us in certain spaces, and so I'm hoping to be one of those people. And I want all my friends to be those people too. And I want everyone to see someone that looks like them outside doing something they love and be inspired to do the same thing. You are welcome here. You as you, looking like you, talking like you, laughing like you, moving the way that you move are welcome here and this place is for you. That's, that's the hope. All right, everybody, I hope you were able to see that. Um, I love that film so much, and I am really happy that you're all here to, to join us for this panel discussion tonight that's moderated by Faith. Um, this film, one reason I love it is because it's, it, was, uh, it was made by a lady crew. Um, Faith was really important behind the camera and in front of the camera, um, and it was directed by Whit Hassett and Chelsea Jolly, so I love that. Um, so speaking of Faith, she's gonna be moderating our panel discussion tonight and I am so honored to introduce her. Um, she is a self-described nerd, a uh, professional nerd and a documentary filmmaker that is passionate about sharing com contem contemplatory stories from diverse communities. Um, she played a significant role in this film, as I mentioned, and I can't imagine a better person to be moderating this panel. Um, anytime I get to hear her talk, it just, fills me with delight. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, Faith, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. And let's have the panelists go ahead and turn on their cameras and microphones. If you're muted. <laughs> Oh, there it is. I was like, I'm muted by the organizer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cool. So I'm so excited to be here. And um, it brings me such joy to have Jose Gonzalez, Ana Meharry, and Ani Kamenui here with us. Um, and I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves um, because I'll get to talk about all the things that they do as we go through the panel. But um, I always enjoy how people introduce themselves. Um, and I was gonna say in your intro, give us a sense of who you are, where you're from, and what kind of work or passions led you to here. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> 
um ne adam harry minani a ne kuyui papana na da way ne kuyui te kara dene no hello everyone my name is autumn harry i am both paiute and navajo uh numu and dene from pyramid lake in northern nevada um and i live here on the reservation and yeah i i'm a graduate student at the university of nevada reno um, i'm studying geography and indigenous place names and I'm a fisherwoman, I'm an indigenous rights advocate, I'm a hiker, backpacker, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of roles that, um, in projects that I'm involved with, and yeah, I'm, you know, growing up on the reservation, I've been able to, you know, I've had a great privilege of, of being able to go outside and to go fishing and to have a, a family that has really taught me those teachings and um, I come from a family who's very involved in, in water rights um, advocacy and you know my mom is really involved in in the mining industry and bringing awareness to the injustices that the mining industry brings within Nevada especially to our indigenous communities and so um, yeah so I think I, I was you know, very fortunate to grow up into a family that has taught me the importance of conservation and how we can do it from our own lenses. Ani here. Oh, Ani is muted. <laughs> Jose, do you want to go in the process? <laughs> I can make the effort. Can you hear me okay? Great. Buenas tardes, everybody. Saludos from um, from California, uh, where every, whatever time zones you, everybody else is. Um, there's, I guess I will start by saying as a way to kind of how I layer my identity, which I kind of call also a quantum identity um, perspective. I um, consider myself Mexicano by birth, uh, US citizen, but through naturalization, uh, Latino through social cultural identity, Chicano through social political identity, and Hispanic by census count. Um, however incomplete that is, make sure you all complete your census because it still does matter. And what got me here was my my training is in education, uh, specific, and by education, I mean uh, in terms of classroom teaching, but that has incorporated also um, outdoor environmental education and a few other educational spaces. Uh, and in terms of getting into this idea of quote unquote conservationists, and yes, I'm using the, the, the air quotes uh, deliberately and purposefully, is what I call kind of this uh, mestizaje of, be, of going from uh, identif you know, understanding the whole process of being uh, bicultural, and then what I would see as ambicultural, and what I say now quantum cultural in terms of like reconnecting and rerouting with what would be connection to land and nature in a way that um, incorporates um, both remembering, reconnection, but trying to get away from an old question that I had about feeling like you have to leave your cultura at the trailhead, that you're now entering a different cultural space um, in terms of how you behave, how you're seen, how you're valued, what, what you're eating, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and fast forward to now, you know, in many ways, um, uh, um, my work has been really to try to both share that perspective of narrative and how it can be different, more expansive, um, as well as try to do my own role to kind of expand uh, this idea of conservationist that is, it's not limited um, even by that word itself. Let's see if this works now. I'm Ani Kameinui and I work for an organization in DC called the National Parks Conservation Association, which is um, what brought me to faith and this wonderful documentary. Um, I also used to work for Oregon Wild, which is how I have great fondness for the organization and all the work that they do to protect federal lands in my home state. Um, 
I came to this work in a very roundabout way. I grew up with a very deep sense of place. I am an Oregonian. I grew up in Eugene in the Wyoming Valley um, and was really um, taught to love where you're from and the land you're a part of um, by both sides of my family, but most importantly by my grandmother who um, was a Montanan. Um, and we spent every summer vacation. We had the great privilege of having the outdoors and having national parks and having public lands be a part of our daily life and it really was a privilege and um, that was very much uh, a known quantity to me. But I came to policy work actually from education and from engineering and I had spent a long time trying to identify what I feel like is one of the most effective ways to get at um, change when it comes to protecting our public lands and spaces for all voices and all people. Um, and it's been a really fantastic and wonderful journey, um, but certainly not a linear one. Um, and I've lived in DC for 10 years this round um, and have been working on Capitol Hill for all of those 10 years working specifically on public lands policy um, that relates very directly for some good reasons and for some bad reasons to all of the um, issues that have already been raised in everyone's personal introductions. Cool, thank you. And thank you all for the work that you do and for being here. Um, so that's kind of the big picture of what you do and, and why you're here. I'm wondering if each of you can share something smaller, maybe a story um, that would tell the audience a bit about what perspectives you bring to conversations about the outdoors. And that could be a special place to you, maybe an aha moment that you had outside. Um, and I think also as we're all missing some special places, it would be nice to hear about other people's special places right now. And I think maybe we'll just do like Maybe I'll just popcorn you guys. Okay, since it's hard to say. Okay, let's go with um, Jose first this time. Great, thank you. Well, that's a really good question. I There's an abundance of moments, thankfully, and for which I'm grateful. I would say, um, I'm gonna pick one that maybe a uh, few people know, I have shared it, but maybe uh, it's not as common, is that uh, on a, with some, after being accepted to grad school, uh, some friends and I decided to essentially carpool road trip our way towards the East Coast. It was an opportunity, obviously, to get to our respective schools, but also do something we had never done before. I had never you know, done anything like that type of road tripping across the U.S. and that it would take us through um, places we've never been. And for me, that was my first time uh, getting to, uh, seeing the uh, Grand Teton National Park. And seeing it for the first time was both awe and majestic. And I recall having a specific moment stopping into a small town, into a little store where I saw ice cream being advertised. I wanted ice cream, I go in. And I, I think there is a way in which you know that if you identify right as a person of color, you know when you're not wanted. <laughs> and I just got this feeling the look directly as if get out of here. And I thought forever that would ruin my uh, perspective and view of a place like that. Uh, on one end, though, it helped me really kind of hold both of those ideas, how uh, that's both real and I get to also frame what my experience is in a majestic place like that. And I thought, well, when am I ever going to come back to Wyoming? The irony is that I've probably been to Wyoming way more many times than I ever thought I would be for such a... For, diverse, weird variety of reasons, which I'm happy to share another time. Um, and yet that always reminded me almost as of a way that I can, I'll keep coming back. And as Faith noticed, each and each, in every time that follows, I feel like I can return even mo much more so of myself. Well, I love that. And just for everyone um, who's here in the audience, we're so happy to have you here. and. Um, know that I am seeing your questions and after we get through a few I'll um, be pulling questions from you too so if something comes up as you're listening feel free to drop your questions here and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, let's go Ani. Um, 
So uh, I, it's so funny, Jose, that you mentioned the Tetons because it's um, people, I find it very obnoxious that people always ask me what my favorite park is as if that defines your sense of advocacy. But the Tetons is one of my first and earliest memories of a, of a very specific park visit and I feel the same way. But um, I, I have two, two different ends of my um, public land spectrum that I hold, I hold very dear. And one is I mentioned my grandmother and um, she spent a lot of time and raised my mom on the Selway River um, between Idaho and Montana. And um, the Selway is a remarkable place and it is very quiet. Um, and we as a family had the luxury of spending time there in the summer and camping and doing family triathlons. And I think doing that early and having my family talk about that, those opportunities early, um, having public land manager family members um, made it part of sort of the, the bloodline of expectation in some ways, um, which I think is really, I recognize now, particularly with my own kids, is a real distinct privilege. Um, but it also set the bar for what protection looks like very, very high. My ex expectation for what public lands and shared public spaces should be was very high. It was, it was the purity of wilderness, which brings me to the other end of this spectrum, which is coming to DC and um, at the beginning of the Obama administration, trying to embrace the idea of national monuments, which is what Faith's film focuses on. Um, and this idea that a national monument would be enough and talk about the privilege of, of public lands is that what I was doing in my mind was whether a national monument or wilderness area was adequate, not whether or not I was welcome in those spaces. And so talk about a full range of how you see and feel and breathe in public lands. Um, and national monuments, they recognize and appreciate a very different level of protection than someplace like the Solway River. And so marrying those two perspectives along with all the people that use those spaces and should use those spaces was a real um, eye opener to sort of the span of my life on public lands and embracing public lands, two very different universes um, and a lot to learn. And I'm so grateful for that in that space in between. Yeah, so a story that I like to tell um, that really grounds me is actually just my people's history. Um, you know, being in Northern Nevada, we're part of the Truckee River watershed. And so I know a lot of people are familiar with Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe flows through the Truckee River and ends up um, in our homelands at Pyramid Lake. And in the early 1900s, um, the Bureau of, of um, Reclamation um, placed a dam just right outside the boundaries of our reservation. And um, when they did that dam, it was to divert water away from our lake and from our river system and they diverted that water and when they did that our lake ended up dropping 80 feet and then we had a sister lake which is Winnemucca Lake that completely dried up and the Truckee River is the you know the river that our fish spawn in and our people you know we're, we're fish people um, we've survived on fish for thousands and thousands of years and we have a Lahaan cutthroat trout and historically these fish were known to get to be 42 pounds, you know, 30, 39 inches, these really huge fish um, that were abundant within our lake. Um, once the river levels got so low, they could no longer travel upstream and they could no longer spawn. And because of that, they end up going extinct in the 1930s. And, you know, that's a huge loss to our, our identity as Numa, as Paiute people. And so growing up, I've always, you know, I've known this history and it's really grounded me because I want to ensure that that never happens again, that we are doing our best to advocate for our water and doing everything that we can to protect our fish because it does feed our people. And, you know, like I said, it's part of our identity. And so that is really what motivates me to do the work that I do and, and making sure that our fish are safe and that our people are being taken care of. That's awesome, thank you all. And I, I'm gonna share a quick story too um, from, from the film. So um, in the first place we're running is Cascade Siskiyou National Monument, which is in Southern Oregon, that's Multnomah land. 
um, and then we moved down to um, uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, um, which is Ute land, and I was running there, um, and then went down to Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks, and, and I got to run with uh, Jose um, down in um, what is historically uh, Mescalera Row Apache land. And the only place I was running by myself um, was in Escalante. And I was, you know, in each place I was trying to run in different ways, right? So I had like an all woman crew of trail runners that I really look up to that um, are friends from Oregon that I was um, in the first place with. And um, down in Oregon mountains, I went down with Jose and he had really introduced me to the community there. And we ended in a piscada and had carne asada and like people came out like local politicians and people from Nuestra Tierra and like, it was amazing. And in Escalante, I was by myself. And the, we had to change the route because it rained and all this stuff. And on one of the days um, when I was running, I basically got three miles in and it took me like two hours because the trail was overflowing. I crossed like three times and couldn't get back across this river. Like it was just a mess. I ended up lost trying to cross somewhere else where I'd seen a tree and then I'm falling down this like rock that was crumbling beneath me then the mosquitoes came out then the freaking cacti started kicking me then i'm crawling on my hands and knees like trying not to cry under the sagebrush trying to get back to the river being like just find the river just find the river you'll get back and i obviously did not finish you know i was trying to do 20 miles a day that day and i remember feeling so disappointed about not getting through that mileage and then i got on the phone with my dad and i was sobbing and he's like what's this film about and i was like it's about like access to the outdoors and being able to be out there with your people and everyone feeling welcome and da -da -da. And he was like, and you were by yourself today, huh? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, so interesting that when you were by yourself, that was the day that was the hardest to get through. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like this is the essence of this. And so, you know, just that moment always sticks with me um, that being able to be outside with people I love and get to learn from so much um, means so much. Um, so yeah, thank you all for sharing those um, special moments. Um, so I'm gonna ask a question to each person um, that's directed at you, um, but if anyone else is like, oh, and also my experience and wants to jump in there, feel free. Um, so Ani, you have all of this amazing expertise in public lands policy, including designations and water resource policy, and you were lobbyist with the Sierra Club in DC and Washington DC and a lot of people don't even think that like when you're thinking about lobbyists you're thinking about the outdoors um can you make that connection for us I'm wondering if you can kind of show some examples of how the place that we hike the place that we camp we go backpacking the rivers that we fish in you know the parks in our neighborhood what do those places like what are the connections to the work that you do in DC yeah um so often when I if I introduce myself as a as a lobbyist, I get a lot of it depends who I'm talking to, but I get a lot of looks. My mom always says, like, tell them what you do <laughs> so that they don't think you're crazy. Um, so I am still a lobbyist. I am still a registered lobbyist. Um, and in that work, uh, I work with members of Congress, the administration less so these days on building and um, managing our public lands and waters um, building the policies that manage our, our public lands and so you know what that essentially means is that whether it's your local park mount hood wilderness um, or everything in between the trails you're on the signs that direct you toward those trails the funds that provide for rangers to um clean the bathrooms re replace the toilet paper all of those simple pieces that we take for granted when we are accessing public lands um are all provided through a, obviously a variety of management policies and funds that all happen in DC. Um, implementation is obviously across the country, but all of those little pieces have to go through some series of laws and policies um, that are implemented in, in the nation's capital. Um, you know, when you're in an administration that is directly undermining a lot of those policies that make that access easier um it is all the more important to have people working on the policy side of the ledger um and so a lot of the work that i do these days is defending the national monuments that you are running through faith and looking at 
um, how we reestablish legal cases for whether it's the Antiquities Act or the Clean Power Plan and um, ensuring park and public lands, um, air and water are clean. And so, you know, a lot of it is the protection of the places we know and love are managed by policies from many decades ago, but the day-to-day -day of all of that goes through those decades old and sometimes antiquated laws. Um, you know, when we look at um, the implementation decisions about all of these places and, you know, how public lands are created, the, the role of the public is so incredibly important. And we saw that so acutely with the National Monuments decision. Um, you know, NPCA, the National Parks Conservation Organization Association that I work with is one of many organizations and uh, alongside several sovereign nations um, in Indian country that absolutely believe that decision was illegal. Um, and the public played such an important role in responding to the administration, but that public role was made possible by a really important policy that is defended on a daily basis in DC. The National Environmental Policy Act, the ability for people to have public comment, the ability for over 2 million people to comment to the Department of Interior on that is a policy that is maintained by the public, but really facilitated, facilitated through the agencies and policymakers here in DC. And so for better or worse, the work that we do here in DC is so incredibly important to ensuring uh, that the experiences on the ground are positive or, or these days, frankly, they're a lot more uh, negative. The centralization of decision making in DC during this administration has been really challenging. Um, and I work for an organization that has a really strong bipartisan history. It's 100 years old. It was established by the original Park Service directors to be an advocacy voice on both sides of the aisle. Um, but these days, when you talk about policy and you talk about public lands access, it is impossible to sort of um, break away from the realities that we're facing right now in terms of how public lands policy being made and dictated in DC um, is affecting your experiences on the ground. Um, you know, we're seeing cuts um, proposed by this administration to budgets that are higher than we've ever seen before. Um, we have a dramatic increase in oil and gas leasing on public lands, which is obviously uh, a major issue, particularly in the West. Um, so, you know, it's a long-winded answer to, again, whether it's the trails you walk on or the bathrooms you use on your way to the trail or um, you know, simply a city park, all of those pieces are created through management policies that um, run through the halls of Congress. I have a quick follow-up question to that. And it, it's, it's kind of like, does it matter? Like if I go, you know, for my very first time and I visit, um, you know, the Rockies, or if I watch this film and I realize like, hey, some of the places that Faith was running are no longer protected with national monument status. And maybe I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, but I like wanna talk to someone about it. And I say like, call my senator or talk to my senator. And like, I send them a note and I'm like, hey, I want Escalante to be protected. Senator, mm -hmm. like, does, does that kind of reach out matter? <laughs> It's a great question, one we get asked a lot. So they've done a lot of polling and, and you know, collected a lot of data from members of Congress on this exact question in terms of like what matters most. And direct constituent to member and constituent to office outreach is the number one most well-received sense uh, type of outreach. Um, in other words, your voice is actually more effective than my, effective than my voice, and somehow I've made a career out of, you know, <laughs> not being that effective apparently. So it's, um, you know, it is incredibly important, and there are different, very ways in which you can obviously play a role in engaging with your lawmakers. Um, I always encourage people, you know, it feels, especially in these times where public lands policy is so intensely under fire, that it feels um, defeating at times to just take, take and do an action alert from Oregon Wild or, um, you know, do one of those call your senator, call your member of Congress moments. But those numbers really matter. And I've been in enough members offices to hear them do those tally counts and what calls they're getting and who they're hearing from and why they're hearing from people. That it is incredibly important and it is incredibly valuable. And those numbers, every single office gets those numbers at the end of the day. And so if you wanna make your voice heard, 
I promise you that those voices and those numbers absolutely do matter and, and frankly they matter now more than ever. Um, it's a really critical year, it's a really critical time and um, having those having those phone calls and having those conversations, whether it's in your local offices, in wherever you live with your local member of Congress, which I think are incredibly underrated because there are local offices for so many members, um, or it's a trip to DC, right? Um, those, all of those pieces are incredibly important. And Jose, did you have a thought? Yes, I'll add this very quickly. Um, in terms of the representation, both out in the actual land is the representation in those actual offices. Uh, the time that I spent also doing policy work in DC, I was uh, in some ways, I don't know what the expression would be, but definitely surprised by especially, for example, seeing Latino staffers when we would go in and saying, huh, you're not just coming in with fill in the blank. Uh, expected environmental uh, conservation advocacy group. And not that there was anything bad, it's just that there, that was familiar to them to some degree. So knowing that the way that we also would add our voices to that conversation um, mattered a lot because all of a sudden um, it opened up a couple of, 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 of different things um, uh, and ways that could expand to what was already happening. Cool, very cool. Um, Autumn. Firstly, congratulations. Autumn was Nevada Citizen of the Day, I think last week, um, which was so cool. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, we met uh, through Brown Folks Fishing and we're both ambassadors there and I've been looking um, at all of these beautiful fish that Autumn has been pulling out of the <laughs> lake, bringing to elders' houses and really raising awareness about how to protect elders. Um, in this time and it, it's been um, so, so cool to see. Um, and I read a testimony uh, from Autumn recently uh, to the Committee of Government Affairs for Nevada where you were talking about how indigenous peoples and ancestors have demonstrated a commitment to natural resources protections um, and yet their important contributions are left out and that it would be really important to formally recognize those contributions. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like why, how that would help and why it's so important. Yeah, so I will actually finish on the, the story that I started earlier because that was, you know, kind of sad and negative. Um, but, you know, that's what happened with, with our fish going extinct. So the extinction happened within the 1930s but then in the 1970s, there was a, a scientist who was um, right on the Nevada-Utah border, and he was out fishing, and he saw these tiny little fish in a stream. And he's like, hey, this kind of looks like Lahontan cutthroat trout, which is the trout that went extinct. And so once they started doing more DNA testing, they actually confirmed that that small trout species came from Pyramid Lake. And so, you know, someone knew back then that our fish were in danger of going extinct and they were taking fish from here and planting them in different areas. And for some reason, this tiny creek allowed for them to survive. And so because of that, um, you know, the, the tribe was, uh, you know, the, ma the major leader for that, for bringing those fish back. But we also worked with federal agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Nevada Fish and Game, to actually bring that fish from Pilot Peak, that creek, plant them back into Pyramid Lake. And we planted them in 2006. And so those fish have been planted, you know, they've returned um, and they've been in there for 14 years. And so now we're seeing these fish getting to 26 pounds. So they're, you know, they've returned and they're doing really well. And that's because of all of this advocacy and all of this work that was done by the tribe. Um, and it was a reminder that, you know, our people have always been here. We've always been caretakers. But, you know, again, it's it's our identity that's at stake. It's our culture. It's our future generations, you know, I, I want my future grandkids to be able to go fishing and to be able to eat fish. And, um, you know, it's it's really important for our community to, to have that. And um, so because of all of the work that's been involved, you know, on the federal, state and tribal level, we've been able to, um, you know, get, get water rights. And because we're 
in this Truckee River system, we have to make sure that the cities uh, and the communities that are living upstream are also following our water quality standards downstream. Um, and because of our, our fish species, we've been able to get primary water rights within this watershed, which is amazing. And we have our tribal water quality team here that, that does water quality monitoring, and we have a, a great fisheries program that you know maintains our fish populations. And I just want to share this picture because I was out fishing this morning, and I caught the biggest fish that I've caught so far. Um, and I think you can see it a little bit, um, but you can see how, how big our fish get. Um, and this one was just over 10 pounds. Um, so this is, you know, this really gives me hope that our fish are doing well, our people are happy, um, and our people are, are reclaiming our lake right now. Um, due to COVID-19, our tribe actually shut down uh, sh shut out public access. So our tribal members have full access to our lake right now, which hasn't happened for a really, really long time. Um, and so all of us are, are using this time to, to be with the lake, to be with the fish and to use that as, as healing for us. Totally, thank you. And you know, it's so interesting, the very first time I went knowingly to a national park um, because I had gone to the um, African burial grounds in New York City, not knowing it was a national park, I went to Yosemite with the National Parks Foundation, and I remember then hearing that they were going back to indigenous knowledge on how to care for the valley because the ways that they had cared for it in the past had done things like mess up the water table, and they were really struggling. And it's it it's so it goes back to being so important of uh, essentially based on the way our country was, we were doing things like you know creating wilderness, which is the highest standard of protection, but doing that by forcing indigenous people off of their land and then create our national park system and being like, it's untrammeled by man. It's like, no, it's not untrammeled by man. It was untrammeled by white man. And now we've created this system and we don't, we're not even taking the knowledge from the people that were there first who know how to care for it. And so that's what I think, it just shows how important it is that we work together. It's like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel when people have been doing this work um, for mm -hmm. such a long time. Um, so thanks for sharing that very specific story that, that shows that. Yeah. Um, Jose, I, I've been, I, I feel like I, I, I always, I call Jose my guiding star, um, my guiding light in this, in this work, um, because I feel like I, I just been able to learn so much from you and being able to run down Oregon mountain desert peaks with you was amazing. And, um, you know, I didn't know, like Jose, like he said that he would run like a mile a day. So when I was like, do you want to run 20 miles with me? And he's like, sure. I was like, how's this going to go? Like Jose had been secretly running more than a mile a day, but I had no idea. Um, so we went out and ran 20 miles and it was incredible. Um, and in the film, you'll see uh, Jose is wearing the Tejana and has a bandera, bandana with them. And we've talked a lot about that idea of bringing yourself with you. Um, on the trail or wherever you find yourself. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I know you had one story I loved about um, a Latino outdoors outing of how people came out. I think there was a dad and I love that, that story, but also just how your personal journey has been um, in terms of showing up how you want outside. Yeah, it's a great question. And that, I think that's important. You know, I don't know. I'm curious about who's watching this right now because I think there is a reminder for many of us that do this work how important it is for you to both share you not you know not just the success but the struggle and what it means to to be yourself as much as possible because for me um, immigrating from Mexico and growing up especially my middle school and high school years um, there was it was hard because there was little to be proud to be Mexican. Uh, so much of the culture um, around you um, came with a sense uh, of shame or guilt, right? And I remember once a friend saying, I'd rather tell people that I'm Spanish <laughs> because at least that way, um, you know, it, we, it, we just made it easier for him. And so it wasn't really until college and really leaning in a little bit around a Chicano identity that I got to be able to flip that around to be able to understand how culture can be an affirmative, positive grounding and strengthening. Um, anchor. Uh, and again, this is also ne never to romanticize or glorify culture just as, as a thing, right? Or ethnic culture specifically, because we all must do uh, 
work to ensure that we always amplify and grow that which heals us and we challenge and disrupt that which which harms ourselves and others but i'll say that because then that really has had meant at the beginning same thing with the outdoors which is how do you fit in what tells you that you belong outdoors uh, when we say well, what are the the narrative structures and the storytellers um, and we that can literally mean what is the catalog and the brand right of the clothing of the food that you're supposed to be taking out there. So I started by making a deliberate effort by taking my huaraches out with me so that I could um, take a photo of them in wherever I was hiking. And they actually went with me to the Arctic National, you know, to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which if any of you have gone, I know Faith has gone, and then you ever get in one of those small planes, every bit of weight counts. <laughs> so you're supposed to be making highly conscious decisions about what you take. So it's a perfect example of saying, these matter to me so much that I'm willing to like sacrifice other type of weight or be able to take those with me. And I've translated that to be able to really, if I'm gonna be out there and you see I'm wearing some of the work from Tierra Libertad as well, the bandana on that movie comes from them as a way that recognizes both how to, elevate these positive aspects of culture and that comes with recognize that uh, much of uh, for many of, of us our mestizo identity is both colonizer and colonized so that requires both attention and work and for me is what is what is that garden to cultivate right because i never want to be like well all of that is bad and all of this is good and only this is good and this is bad i'm like that the whole garden requires uh tending and so I'll close by saying that it has really forced, challenged and invited me, I should say that, to pay attention to when we go outdoors, what are we really looking for and asking um, or want to support? So in that story with the parents, it wasn't about what they were wearing. They actually came fully decked out in their Sunday best, not suitable for the trail. But really, what it, if they were both safe and comfortable, it didn't matter what they were wearing and we could support that. Um, and then being able to do that not just in what we what we are you know what we're eating and what what we look like but also in how we're speaking and what words we use so hence that what once when i started using ambicultural not just bicultural as a way just like being ambidextrous you could leverage both um, levels of your culture to 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 use code switching in, in a much more affirmative way rather than as a survival mechanism that sometimes many of us use Totally, yeah. Um, I'm gonna look at some of the audience questions. So the first one we have is um, one I think a lot of us have had the conversation a lot. So it's as a white person, what is the best way I can use my privilege to make a welcoming space for people of color in the in the outdoors? And I I know that can be an entirely different panel. So maybe if you have a few like really um, specific ones uh, that are your favorites. <laughs> Yeah, my favorite is just just researching the land that you're on when you're traveling, uh, you know, where you grew up. It's so important to to recognize and just acknowledge the original peoples of those areas. And, you know, a lot of indigenous communities have nonprofits and have frontline organizers who are doing this work. So if you do your research, you can find those direct people to support as well and to can you, uh, continue learning from. I would say, we'll make... go ahead, Annie. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think the other, and another um, great piece is to sort of change the narrative that we, the story we tell ourselves about public lands. Um, and part of that includes Autumn's suggestion, right? Learn the story, the real story, but also, you know, there is a long time where America's national parks have been called, you know, America's best idea. And, um, you know, I have a wonderful colleague who says, the national parks don't even crack the top 10, right? Like of America's best ideas. Brown versus Board of Education, Civil Rights, Bill of Rights, GI Bill. I mean, the list goes on. So to suggest that we tell ourselves this ahistorical version of what the national parks represents, immediately sets forth a narrative about public lands that is exclusive. And so I think part of it, um, part of our ob obligation and particularly mine is to change the way we tell the narrative, make sure that when we're talking about all stories, we really are talking about all stories. Um, 
and you know, recognize that the, the year the National Park System was created in 1916, 55 African Americans were lynched the same year. And so the story we tell ourselves about who the National Parks were created for and why they were created um, is so important to just the frame that you enter the public lands with. And so I think regardless of your personal background with national parks or public lands um just recognizing the, the story we tell ourselves it, it, it has to be it has to be changed in order to be more inclusive three quick things one decenter yourself what if you are quote unquote not normal what would that look like then to pay attention to somebody else two listen just be ready to listen before you're going to fill in the space with anything else and then three, be okay with what comes after that or do that work for yourself. If you get told no, then that's okay as well because you need to be careful about how you're leaning with the curiosity. You may wanna to get to know someone, but you need to pay attention as to uh, being okay to just not get a response. Some awesome, awesome answers. Um, and uh, we have a website for the film called thislandoc.com, and we've been pulling together resources under the play, learn, and take action areas. Um, so on learn, there's a lot of different things you can read to just educate yourself. On play, there's all kinds of groups and people that you can go out with and support their work and, and learn from. So maybe there's some some uh, resources on there as well. Um, thanks for that question there, Clara um daisy hello <laughs> um how long did it take to run all three sections and what's it like camping under the big sky um so we tried to average 20 miles a day and so i think it's hard to tell on the film but the first day we accidentally ran 26 and we were just like oh my gosh is every day gonna <laughs> be like this um so we ended up doing uh two days in oh, two days in cascade siskiyou three in escalante well ended up being four because i missed a day and then to in Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks. Um, and what really took a while was driving between um, each place as well, because the filmmakers, the directors were also the drivers. Um, I got my uh, driver's license on day one of filming so that I could help uh, driving for the first time as a New Yorker. So I think in total, we were out on the road for just under two weeks. Um, how can land managers be more inviting to minorities and get the word out that these places are open to all? um is a question from wayne yeah what, yeah <laughs> uh, what what land management agencies are we talking about no um so, so I will say that after working through the entirety of the Obama administration, um, there was a lot of work done to um, do a better job of encouraging land managers to um, change the way, change the story they told themselves about who and where, you know, who these lands were for. Um, but there were also a lot of new programs that were started, a lot of new uh, a cultural diversity internship, uh, lots of funding that went into things like the Every Kid in a Park program, specifically for the reason to provide opportunities for land managers to encourage kids from urban centers, kids from everywhere to get into parks and have a, a park experience. So, um, it, it start in many ways for land managers, it starts from the top um, and there has to be an ethos uh, of inclusivity and a willingness to, to reframe the telling of all stories, particularly in national parks as well as other public lands. But um, I, I have a pretty DC centric perspective on that one. I'm certainly interested in others. Autumn, after you. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> There, yes, and uh, there it does. There is a degree of difference. Obviously, when we say land management, it's very different from Bureau of Land Management, for example, to National Park, in terms of how they center their mission and so forth. Um, and of course, there are still specific roles within those agencies that really do their best to try to focus that. I would add a key component that I think has uh, has come up often is ensuring that the law enforcement um, divisions of, 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 of those components. So if you're a land manager, what is your law enforcement um, arm? How are they approaching this? Because all it takes is one negative or bad experience through that, that it can undermine a lot of good work that other parts of your agency are doing. Uh, and it could be completely, like you said, 
um, not the intention, but as we do in this work, there's a difference between intent and impact. You still have to pay attention and manage for that because some of the harmful experiences that happen um, in cityscapes, for example, can transfer over to um, to the outdoors and that reinforces and, uh, uh, you know, actions of exclusion. Yeah, I'll just add quickly. Um, so yeah, land managers is, is a pretty broad term and it definitely depends on the agency uh, that you're trying to work with. But I think a big thing that, you know, national parks, especially, um, I remember a couple of years I was at Yellowstone and talking to some of the, I think the deputy superintendent and I was part of like this internship program and they had this long presentation about all of the initiatives that they have to increase diversity within the park and to be more inclusive to, you know, brown, black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, and then I asked, well, how many of your staff, you know, what's the percentage of your staff and employees that are actually uh, people of color? And it was just a tiny, tiny percentage. And, you know, when you're going to national parks and to these uh, public lands and you're not seeing your own people represented within those within those spaces, you know, that's another form of um, like exclusivity, right? You're, you don't feel as welcome. Whereas if you were to see your own people working and, and getting employed. So I think that's a big initiative um, that, you know, national parks and uh, and land managers can take is just hiring more brown and people of color. Totally, we're we're over time, but we're going to keep going a little bit. Thanks so much to our panelists that are giving us a little bit more of their time. So we're going to ask a, just a couple more questions. Um, so I have a, a Miguel Sotole, Sotelo says hi, Jose. We were together a few times, <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask. Uh, if at all, um, does trail running or other forms of recreation, have they further developed your connection to self and land and place? I can make that quick. Short answer is yes. And uh, in case it was not clear, so last year, my goal was to run a minimum of a mile a day. That's where Faith was saying, it's like, if he's running only a mile, is he gonna survive for 20 out here? Um, and so I said, yes, there were days I ran more, including the one with faith <laughs> and survived. I need a shirt that says I ran with faith and I survived. Uh, <laughs> and so I said that the goal was there, not just for the discipline of like running every day. I wanted, and of course it comes with the acknowledgement of the privilege of being able-bodied and that I was not, not uh, I didn't fall sick in any way. So last year I ran every single day, no matter where I was, regardless of the weather, um, I ran. And that took me everywhere. And running for me wasn't just about the actual physical uh, action of running, and it wasn't like purely the discipline. But two important components are one was connection to place. So even when it was in urban or cityscapes, to pay attention to where I was, what was around me, and then in, in out in open land, what the land was telling me. Um, it is, it reinforced for me something that I would, did not expect many years ago of how rich and alive the desert is and how much more it could share with me than, uh, than another expected uh, nature source. And then the last one is how much it was helpful for my meditation. Um, so active running meditation for me uh, really helped a lot. Awesome, oh man, okay. You got some good ones in, guys. <laughs> some amazing, amazing people here. Um, okay, we're gonna go first with um, David Robles. Isolation is very real right now um, for many VIPOC and ethnic communities. Isolation has been very real for centuries due to racism and xenophobia towards these groups and people. What are the ways we can inspire and empower our communities to break these barriers that forcibly isolate us um, when a large majority is hostile towards our very existence? Ooh, a big question. <laughs> it's a huge question, but I, I actually wanted to um, flag 
a piece that Jose wrote recently about the closure of public lands because of the um, virus. And one of the things that I loved about that piece, um, which I think was in High Country News, is that right? Yeah. Um, was the recognition of the very important role. So the, this question is huge. Talk about um, questions for a whole other panels. But as it applies to the time right now, one thing I just wanted to, to highlight from Jose's piece was um, that this is an opportunity to reframe the way that we think about access. Um, and for a group like mine that thinks a lot about both urban and rural places, um, it's a real opportunity for us to think differently about how we cooperate with urban centers in terms of providing access. Um, you know, really trying to encourage the National Park specifically to be places where no matter what you look like or what you represent or how you sound, you see yourself in the parks. But that is ever more true right now when we are so intensely isolated. And the example that you had flagged in your piece, Jose, was about the city of Denver that was closing city streets so that people could have access. And where I live, they're doing some of the same thing in the DC area. And the power of that is remarkable. It's so simple. It's such a simple thing, but it has provided such terrific access for so many different kinds of people to see the opportunity now that maybe has not frankly been there before because of the other factors of isolation. I'm very hopeful that what we come out of this is a new perspective on how to create more cooperative opportunities, whether it's between urban centers and you know state and city states and cities and feds, um, to create more of those common physical spaces for us to coexist together. I love I love that idea. We're gonna keep going, and um, but gosh, there's so much. And I know we're all like, oh. So I think we're gonna try to get these questions together and see if there's another time to answer more of them. Um, a question from Teresa Baker: How do we get the attention of those outdoor conservation orgs that aren't currently addressing matters of DEI? How do we get the attention? I think a lot of a lot of a lot of people probably um, wonder that too, personally and otherwise. Right. My humorous answer is this. I tell them that I'm gonna um I'm gonna tell Teresa Baker that but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> my my other answer is I think so there's many answers, right? One thing that I think is important to recognize is the need for a spectrum of engagement in terms of um uh, what I'm getting at is uh there's many organizations that when if all they need is a perception of like I'm I'm going to feel attacked or this is going to be too conflict oriented and they shut down and the danger with that is they get to retreat with their privilege and so what's important and and this is where for example talking about Teresa Baker who if none of you follow her follow her on Instagram is to have a coordinated effort among many of us change agents so we understand that we can play different and connected and supportive roles to ensure that those with the power and privilege and the ability to, to change some structures um, on their side uh, don't get to just shut it all down because they might say, okay, I might not be ready, be ready or whatever their excuse is to listen to person A, B, or C, but they will listen to person D and E, and that's important. And that only works if both A, B, C, D, and E are working together for a common goal. Um, so I hope that makes sense. It's just for me that's important because uh it just i'm concerned about the retreat of those with power and privilege uh with with a quite different set of reasons and excuses and then and, and we don't we lose that 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 pushing connection i i think also i'm like party harder you know because i it's like another way of doing it is like everyone else wants to needs to want to be a part of our party you know and i think the more we share our own stories and capture our stories and like create um, films that people are like, I want my name on that thing, or I wanna be sponsoring that event, or I wanna be like supporting the work that that little organization is doing, um, the more we make them you know, realize that if they don't jump in, they're gonna be left behind and they're not getting the invite to the party. And this is the party you wanna be a part of. Um, and I know that the more I see those spaces online and the more I see people Kind of starting their own groups and doing it their way and making it look that much more cool and that much more fun i'm like i want to i want to be at that party and i know that there's so many people working in these organizations that will um feel feel the same way too 
Well, oh my gosh, I'm so sad I can't do all of these questions. I'm so <laughs> thankful um, that you all came and gave us your time. So thankful to Oregon Wild and Merrill for um, bringing their support, hosting this conversation, bringing us all together. So thankful to everyone for being here. Um, and it's just, so it's a small amount. There's so much more. Um, so please do one quick plug if you can. Um, go to thislanddoc.com and join our newsletter. Um, we're going to be sharing more recently, letting you know when there's more cool conversations with folks like these panelists here um, coming around. So we'd love to have you on the newsletter so we can keep you posted. And um, once again, just thank you so much for being here and thanks for being in conversation. And um, each of us should uh, tell us how you can be found, <laughs> whether it's IG, email, Facebook, uh, none of the above, smoke signals. How do we how do we find you guys? Um, and I see if you happen to have a pen nearby, that, that could um, be one way. Oh. <laughs> Jose Lingue. Oh, I just spelled my own name wrong. Ours is easy. You can go to npca.org and you can find me there. Are we supposed to write backwards? <laughs> I wrote it. I, I wrote it because sometimes bilingue is, you know, I'll say bilingue and people's like, I don't know how to spell that. But you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Well, if you follow Faith, maybe I'll pop up on there as well. Uh, follow Teresa Baker. She loves to make fun of me. So you'll definitely find me there. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, a shout out to Latino at Latino Outdoors uh, uh, founded org. Um, and then just say hi. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening or night. Here's mine. <laughs> These coast people. Oh, that's, oh, not, that's wrong. Never mind. <laughs> I tried to write backwards. Wanderer. Wanderer. No more oh, wanderer. I I'm wrong. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>